This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Hello. Welcome to the Michael Cutler Moment. I am Michael Cutler. Thank you for joining me. You know, Memorial Day is approaching, and I've been giving an awful lot of thought to how much we have to be thankful for, even in this turbulent era in which we're living, and most importantly, to be thankful for the men and women of the armed forces who have given so much for the past several centuries to create our nation, safeguard our nation, safeguard our American values, our lives, and most importantly, our freedoms. So that's what I plan to discuss with you today, the freedoms that we enjoy, the freedoms that have been bought and paid for by American blood spilled on foreign shores by America's um, members of the armed forces, most of whom, uh, at the time of their uh, being killed, were quite young. And then think about how many more soldiers have returned home, and I use the term soldier generically. I speak, of course, of all of our branches of the military who have returned home with broken bodies, broken spirits, uh, psychological problems, post-traumatic stress issues. The cost has been enormous. And we sit at home and we enjoy what they bought for us with their bodies, with their health, and all too often with their lives. And when we think about the freedoms that we have, that we sometimes take for granted, you know, it's an entitlement. We're entitled to those freedoms. You know, I think about Ronald Reagan, and I didn't always agree with Ronald Reagan. Truth be known, I'm registered as a Democrat. I've always voted as an independent. But these issues that I'm discussing with you are not about left or right, but they are about right or wrong. And uh, President Reagan said that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. And probably the most important of all of our rights is is the First Amendment. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion. Everybody rattles those three off very quickly. It's by rote. Um, That's what the First Amendment is. But what most people tend to leave out are the other two components of the First Amendment. The right to seek redress of grievances. And my goodness gracious, in this era, if you don't have a grievance, you probably have a flatline EEG. And the right to peaceably assemble. Now think about what that means. Think about it when you see the demonstrators, the violent demonstrators who have uh, gone on their rampages around our country at various times, but especially uh, I think about the Trump political campaign, whether you support Trump or not. And I think he's uh, really the, uh, the only show in town as far as I can determine, given everything that's happening. But think about the demonstrators who weren't simply holding up placards and saying, we disagree with you. That I can deal with. That's as American as apple pie. Think about the intimidation. Think about the violence. Think about the people who came to attend those events peacefully and went to the hospital having been bloodied by those demonstrators. Freedom of speech is critical to our government's survival. And when we speak about freedom of speech, yes, we do need to hear both sides or all sides of an argument. That's fine. You know, I was going to teach speech on the college level. I was a high school debater. I debated on uh, the college debating teams. Uh, And I still participate in debates around the United States at public speaking events. But understand that it's one thing to disagree peaceably as the Constitution uh, mandates. It's quite another to try to shut up your opponent by using violence or threats or intimidation. That's not American. And it's not liberal. You know, I always thought the term liberal meant that you were willing to take other people's feelings, ideas, concepts, and beliefs into account, to have a liberal viewpoint, to be accepting of others. These so-called liberals are anything but they are totalitarian. They will not tolerate anybody's opinion other than their own. And think of how this is playing out on college campuses from coast to coast and border to border. Safe zones where people don't have to listen to somebody who disagrees with them. Um, The words of intimidation. Uh, You know, my issue is immigration. I spent 30 years of my life as an immigration officer, 26 of those years as a special agent. And I understand, and if you've seen my writings, uh, you know that I 
believe in the fair and equitable enforcement of our immigration laws because they serve as our first and last line of defense against those who would hurt us. There's nothing racist about it. There's nothing in our laws that differentiate people by race, religion, or ethnicity. But these folks that want to shut down the debate make the accusations. Well, if you want secure borders, you're a racist. You're a bigot. You're a xenophobe. The words just keep flying. And they're lies. It's not truthful. But they're presented in such a way as to incite violence, to incite hatred, to do anything but allow open discussion. And they do it with good reason. Because you see, folks, the people who want open borders, who want anarchy in our country, and that's really what we're talking about, know that the law, that common sense, that fairness, that morality are all opposed to what they have to say and their position. What is left for them is to intimidate and shut down those who would disagree with them. When Donald Trump said that we are suffering from political correctness, that's a point that I have to disagree with uh, Donald Trump. We are suffering from George Orwell's newspeak. This is absolutely Orwellian. And you know, George Orwell, uh, in his book 1984, constructed this concept of newspeak, the ultimate form of propaganda. And very sagely, Orwell said that in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And indeed, that's exactly what we're witnessing today. Dare speak the truth, and the accusations start flying, and all too often, chairs and bricks start flying. This is un-American. This is unacceptable. And this certainly is not what our men and women in uniform have given their lives for. I worked very closely with the Israeli National Police during my career. I have tremendous respect for them, their professionalism, their commitment. And I remember one night having dinner with an Israeli police general who said to me, Mike, you know, Israelis love Americans and we love America. We think of you as our big brothers. But I don't understand something and most Israelis don't understand something. In Israel, when we have our equivalent of Memorial Day, everything stops. We shut our car engines off. We get out of our cars. We bow our heads in prayer of remembrance for the soldiers who gave their lives defending us, keeping us and our country alive. We don't forget. Radio stations go silent, at least for that minute or two. But he said in the United States, it, it's kind of strange. You celebrate Memorial Day with linen sales and barbecues. And those words keep haunting me. The more that I hear about the armed conflicts overseas, the more that I see where our soldiers have been wounded or killed, the more that those words from that Israeli police general haunt me. So I had a thought that I want to share with you today. How about if from now on, when we celebrate Memorial Day, when we celebrate the valor, the courage, the sacrifices of our men and women in uniform, um, maybe it's okay to have that barbecue, get together with friends and family, but how about if during those get-togethers, we engage in debate and discourse, try to find other ways of engaging in debate and discourse so that we can truly celebrate the First Amendment. The idea that people disagree but can still be friends is as American as apple pie. When I was on the debating team, we often didn't know which side of the argument we would draw in the debate until perhaps 15 or 30 minutes before the debate began so that we learned both sides or as many sides of the argument as possible. Now, something amazing happens when we, in, when we engage in debate and discourse. Sometimes we uh, get our opponents to realize that we're right, and occasionally we find out that we may have made errors, that maybe we need to fine tune our understanding of the issues. And this is a healthy process. And you know what? It's a democratic process. It's a process that Americans, no matter what their political orientation, ought to be celebrating. I've been honored with the ability to speak before Tea Party groups around the United States. Just think about that. This kid from Brooklyn, lifelong registered Democrat, but always voting as an independent, has been given ample opportunities to speak at Tea Party conventions, given prime time. I just came back from Florida, where the Villages uh, sponsored my appearance. Uh, at the Villages Tea Party. This is the way we celebrate America, and this is the way that I would love for all of us to begin to celebrate Memorial Day, 
so that um, the true purpose of what our country stands for can be better understood by everybody. And hopefully, rather than uh, this divisiveness that we see in America, which is tearing us apart, if we can sit down with the people we disagree with and have that debate, have that discussion, perhaps have that argument, but peaceably, as the founding fathers told us we should, maybe we can actually, at the end of the day, all come together and remember what's most important. We are Americans. I thank you so much for uh, taking time out to uh, watch this video. I ask that you please support the Glazov gang uh, at uh, jamieglazov.com. And also, please make certain to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thank you again. I look forward to seeing you the next time. So long for now.